Good garbage is when we have materials that have provided a lot of value in their initial application, that we have ways we can take those materials and use them for another application. To me, it's the circularity. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Good Garbage Podcast. My name is Veth Krishna. My primary reason for existence has been to find ways to leave our wonderful planet cleaner. We will be speaking with material innovators, creators, and propagators to learn from them how we can build for scale and towards a regenerated future. Their stories will help us answer the big question, what is good garbage? It is so rare to meet an individual like Daniel Caraway, who's just so pure in his heart and his intention to leave the planet cleaner. He spent maybe 40 years of his life uh, evolving different products, uh, right from starting with celluloses and international paper with food science, and then moving on to this amazingly interesting product uh, called PHA, uh, which is what we are going to focus on and talk about on this episode. Uh, He's created various companies, uh, the one that he is the founder of and the CEO of now is called RWDC Industries and they are creating and making waves with this new material which is extremely adaptable and utilizes a waste resource like a burnt vegetable oil for creating this bioplastic. Not only that, RWDC has managed to raise a lot of capital, over $189 million now, and are uh, entering another phase of capital raising to be able to scale the amazing technologies that they're creating. It was truly an inspiring conversation for me, and I'm sure you guys would also enjoy it as much as I did. Hello, hello. I'm so happy to have Daniel Caraway from RWDC Industries join us for a chat today. RWDC has been making waves with creating amazing products. And not just that, uh, you know, one of the really inspiring things has been this desire to scale. And that is something we we'll, we are going to learn from Daniel, how he's looking at the products, how he's looking to scale. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for joining me today, for taking the time to chat with us. Well, thank you so much for your interest in RWDC and, and what we're doing. I think there's a, a lot of things that we have in common and I think it's great to be able to connect and, you know, mull over ideas together and out of conversation, sometimes there are some really neat things that that develop out of that. So thank you for your interest and in, in having the conversation. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Daniel. What I realize is that as we are growing up, we have numerous influences that lead us to where we are today. From my research, I saw that you grew up rural and you had a lot of nature in your life, but I would love to hear more about early impacts of packaging, if there were any, and how they influenced your work that you do today? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, that rural upbringing was very influential. I was really amazed as I grew up in that rural agricultural forestry, you know, animal husbandry type setting uh, about the incredible things we saw in nature uh, around us. You know, when you're in a very rural setting, you're you're close to nature you're you're out there every day and just my curiosity tended to be toward uh you know natural uh, environments so as i uh began to to get my formal education i focused on plants natural ecosystems my interest began to move toward biochemistry and molecular biology i was just very curious about well, how do plants make all these incredible you know materials that we use to make our lives pleasant and productive things like cellulose and all the carbohydrates we use from plants fibers plant-based oils and these wonderful materials that we use to make coatings and and paints it's just amazing you know how many natural materials are available from nature for us to, you know, use to make our lives more pleasant and productive. And so I told my children sometimes maybe I stayed in school too long, but I really wanted to understand the the mechanisms, you know, at the molecular level for how all of that happens and thinking that there there would likely be opportunities to 
uh, with that understanding, work better in harmony with nature to continue to, to make things that, that we all enjoy, but really do that in a way that we're, we're not harming the environment, we're not exploiting nature, but we're working in harmony with nature to create materials and create lifestyles. So I'm, I tell people I'm just a professional nerd I just like learning things and and then trying to you know determine well what what's the best way to help help take the things that I've learned and and uh, make people's lives better from that. Yeah, I want to learn more about your career graph because it seems that you went into pulp and paper, uh, but would love to hear how your career progressed from uh, your biotechnology days. Yeah, I think that is really interesting. You know, the pulp and paper industry has touched so many lives because a few decades ago, paper was a, a really important tool in what we did to communicate. And now our communication has moved more to electronic. But what we've begun to realize is that paper is a really nice material for packaging. You know, so for food service and food packaging, the ability to make that enterprise more sustainable, better for our health and safety as humans better for the environment. So yeah, my early career was spent uh, with a company called International Paper and uh, on the fiber supply side. So I spent a lot of time trying to understand how trees made cellulose. You know, when you're trying to make fibers for paper, you have to remove lignin, which is a very complex biopolymer that has amazing functionality in nature. So I ended up working with a number of really brilliant biochemist and molecular biologist, we cloned every gene in the lignin and cellulose synthesis pathways for angiosperm and gymnosperm forest trees. And that exercise enabled us to learn a, just a tremendous amount about the, you know, the mechanisms for how that works. You know, how do these enzymes polymerize these basic building blocks, you know, whether they start with carbohydrates or lipids and uh, just fascinating about, you know, how nature has worked all this incredible chemistry out. It's like, wow, why can't we do that? And so uh, learning how to do that was a lot of fun in, in my early days. And as I looked at this in incredible array of biopolymers that are produced in nature, and contrasting that to the types of synthetic polymers that, you know, we, we typically use, my belief is that, you know, we can really do a great job in improving packaging and improving other types of materials that traditionally are made with, you know, synthetic plastics, which it's really interesting how functional these synthetic plastics are in terms of their physical and mechanical properties. You know, the engineers who built and designed those materials did an incredible job. It's just that they didn't think about end of life and they didn't think about impact on human health and safety. And so they did what we asked them to do. They created these incredible materials that have enabled us to have applications that are, are really wonderful applications in packaging. However, as we use those things in for five or ten minutes and then they never go away. And it's so difficult and expensive to try to, to recycle them. Uh, I thought there's got to be a better way. We, you know, there's all these incredible materials that exist in nature. They also have these wonderful physical and mechanical properties. So how do we, you know, how do we replace some of the materials that we're currently using with ones that are better? Super. And uh, so how long was your time with International Paper? And it's really interesting to hear that, you know, a pulp and paper company was doing things around the biotech domain while you were there and you were already creating materials. So how many years did you spend and how did that uh, transpire into the next stage of your life? Yeah, so I spent, uh, after I completed my PhD at the University of Georgia, I joined International Paper and was with them for a decade. And, um, you know, my responsibility was to grow more fiber on fewer acres with the lowest possible capital input and the highest possible quality uh, while making all of that process sustainable. So had a lot of fun. But like we were saying earlier through that journey, 
I became really intrigued with biopolymers. And, and to your point, how do we use the processes like photosynthesis, where carbon is captured and put into all these wonderful materials that then we can use for whatever we need, whether it's cellulose or some other material. So how do you pivot from being in a pulp and paper business and slowly getting into PHA? How did that come about? How did this idea of uh, PHA emerge? Yeah, well, again, it's probably a pretty boring story because, uh, you know, I was just trying to find materials that could be synergistic with cellulose in terms of making packaging and in terms of making uh, more productivity easier to achieve in agriculture and forestry. So some of the first ideas were around organic mulches for growing, you know, agricultural crops, growing trees. Much of the produce that, you know, we find in our local uh, grocery stores is grown on plastic films, then there's just a tremendous problem with those plastic films accumulating in soils and and severely degrading the productivity of those uh, soils. So I wanted to find a way to use cellulose and, and lignin to achieve the same or better functionality, but eliminate the use of the plastic materials that were causing such problem you know, after the fact. So that was really the start of the journey. And then it just blossomed into all the other things that we're working on now, which is an incredibly broad array. It ranges from agricultural mulches to surgical masks to liquid containers and, you know, coated paper packaging, all the way to personal care items, food service items, food packaging. We have a wonderful team that we've been able to assemble to bring all these things to the point of offering them to the marketplace in in a manner that makes it really exciting and economically viable to start switching from some of the the materials that functionally do a good job, but then from a human health and environmental perspective, they're just not very good choices. And and switching to a, a material that functionally does the same job or better And then, you know, doesn't cause any problems later on. You know, PHA is really interesting because right now our bodies are making PHA. Right now in our liver cells, PHA is being made. And the microbes in our digestive system make PHA. And then our body uses those PHA oligomers for energy molecules. Our brains run partially on PHA. And there are many other a metabolic functions that PHA plays a, a really key role, not only in human metabolism, but almost every living organism that you can name, there's a, a key part of, of that metabolic cycle that PHA plays a role in. And so it's just, it's a natural choice to use for articles that are connected to food or connected to, you know, packaging or other things, because it's, it's not harmful doesn't create microplastics. I tell people that we know now about microplastics, the same level of information we knew in the 1950s and 60s about smoking tobacco. And I'm old enough to remember that there were actual commercials on radio and television that said, this is the cigarette brand that doctors recommend most. But they didn't know back then. And then in the 50s and 60s, we began to realize that, wow, that stuff's really bad for you. It'll kill you. You should not smoke cigarettes. And now we're seeing the same type of information develop with regard to microplastics. And so we're telling people, look, guys, we have to move away from these type of materials, especially in our food packaging and our food service and our clothing, all those areas that generate microplastics, because now we're finding that the average human on the planet has enough microplastic in our body to make a a credit card. The medical community has coined a term for that. They call it plasticosis. So we really begin to see it from the plastics that were used in artificial joint replacements for hips and knees. And so when doctors began to have to go in and replace those joints, they would see this massive chronic inflammation around the site 
And we figured out it's because of the microplastics that are shed from those inserts. Unfortunately, we found that microplastics now are pervasive in our environment. And 80% of the fish that we harvest have microplastics. And so we need to switch to a different material. And these natural biopolymers are the obvious choice that we should make. You know, PHA is not a good substitute for 100% of that, but for about half of it. And and in those single-use plastics, it's an especially good replacement. We would like to take a minute to thank our sponsors. Good Garbage is sponsored by Packer a family of brands that produces compostable packaging and works to implement regenerative solutions. PACA's new project is to bring compostable food service ware and food carry products to the North American marketplace. Learn more at PACA.com. Now back to the conversation. You've obviously told us a lot about how PHA is to be used, but I'm going to step back because even I hardly know what PHA is. What is PHA and how is it made and and why do you think that this is such a wondrous kind of material? So those three. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. You know, PHA is a natural molecule that's primarily used for energy storage. So PHAs are natural polyesters that primarily function in nature as energy storage molecules but they happen to have thermoplastic properties because they are polyesters. And we're all familiar with polyesters, even though we might not know that they're called polyesters. For example, most water bottles are made of a polyester. If you've ever had a a soft drink that was bottled in what we think of as a plastic bottle, that's a polyester material. That's a synthetic polyester but we can actually make those same articles out of natural polyesters that then don't persist in the environment for 500 years after we used it, you know, for five minutes. And so what we can do is take a molecule that's made naturally, primarily for energy storage, but because of its thermoplastic properties, we can make materials that are replacements for the oil-derived plastics that we're accustomed to. And there are a number of metabolic pathways by which different organisms make PHA molecules. And, you know, we say PHA so we don't have to say polyhydroxyalkanoate. And we, the way we make it, you know, at very large scale is that we have domesticated some microbial strains that are very efficient at making PHA. And I like to use the analogy of cattle. And so if you want to be a dairy farmer and make milk and cheese and ice cream, you need a domesticated animal that is very productive at eating grass and turning grass into milk. You end up with something like a Holstein or a Jersey or a Guernsey. But if you're a beef farmer, a Holstein is not what you want because Holsteins aren't very good at producing beef. If you're a beef farmer, you want a black Angus or something like that. So what we've done is we have domesticated a microbe that makes PHA. And so with the the common domestication tools that humans have used for thousands of years to either make corn or lettuce or kale, you know, all of these materials that we use for food come from domesticated organisms. And that, that process typically involves breeding and selection to get those traits that we want. We've taken those same principles, the same process, and developed a portfolio of microbial strains that make PHA. We've known about PHA since the late 1800s, and then over the last uh, little over a century, we've begun to learn more and more about PHA as a natural material and, and how we can use it as really the ideal replacement for for some of the plastics that we've you know that we've been using for the last hundred years, it's taken us until now to really think from a perspective of nature. How do we, rather than exploiting nature, how do we work in harmony with nature? 
So I would love to pivot and talk about RWDC, how it came about, what does the company do, and how do, how is it planning to scale? So, you know, just the ideas around your wonderful company. Well, yeah, thank you for that. So RWDC is really focused to, on improving people's lives. We want to make people's lives better. And the way we think we can do that is by providing materials that are safe. They don't cause problems with human health or for the environment. And so we're focused on these natural materials to do that. And like we've mentioned several times, we want to be available globally. And we've borrowed the concept from the quick serve restaurant industry in terms of having distributed manufacturing that's modular in nature. And so what we've done is we've said, hey, let's let's take this idea of a, a quick serve restaurant franchise and let's modularize the production process so that we can very efficiently replicate it globally. And we'd build a, a sub-assembly and then take those sub-assemblies to a production site and put them together and very efficiently, very rapidly expand our capacity because we want to have a very light ecological footprint in our manufacturing operations. And so by distributing our manufacturing across many different sites globally, we can have zero ecological impact. We can actually improve the ecology of different areas and very rapidly scale up our manufacturing. So that's probably one of the biggest differences in RWDC and some of the other biopolymer or even other polymer operations. Usually you see these large, massive industrial chemical complexes, uh, you know, that are put in place to make these materials. What we would rather do is have, you know, a small ecological footprint, have manufacturing distributed around the world and have it in a way that it's not complex it can be scaled very rapidly and economically to get these materials you know into the hands of people where they can really you know improve people's lives and and work and and do it in harmony with nature so just just a you know a different way to think about it that we think is um, worth considering and our uh, partners and, and our investors seem to uh, agree with us that that's a good approach to take. What interests me, Daniel, is that you came from a background of cellulosis and you could have easily gone to a cellulosic film, but you didn't. You chose uh, PHAs instead. So it's really intriguing for me why, you know, what is the difference and why not go towards alpha cellulose? would love to learn about that decision. You can make some really interesting films with cellulose and there's a lot of a lot of versatility in cellulose however it's not as versatile as pha there are over 150 different types of pha that we find in nature and for cellulose the chemical structure of cellulose as a biopolymer doesn't have as much variety and versatility as pha PHA, there's over 150 different monomers that can be combined in unique ways. And so all of a sudden, now you have hundreds of thousands of different materials that you can make that are still PHA, but they have different physical and mechanical properties. And so that's the reason to choose PHA, not to the exclusion of cellulose or starch, but to give us tools that are very synergistic you know, with the celluloses and the starches and the lignans and the other biopolymers, you know, that we find in nature. But of all the biopolymers that are produced in nature that we've discovered so far, PHA is the most versatile. And also know uh, when, when we look at alpha celluloses that the process is rather harsh and also very energy intensive. In comparison to that, how does PHA work? I know that you sometimes even take burnt vegetable oil or something. So, so you're taking a waste product in a way. We have two routes that we use to make PHA. The one that we're commercializing first is, as you mentioned, waste oils. So there are a lot of plant-based oils that are produced around the globe 
millions of tons. And what we like to do is find those materials after they've been used for either food preparation or, or some other some other use but taking those waste oils and using them as our feedstock. Now, here's the really interesting part. When we bring in a kilogram of waste oil, whether it's from a, a restaurant that's cooked in the oil and now it's no longer you know, usable for cooking food, uh, a lot of it comes from industrial food preparation facilities. They can use it you know, two or three cycles uh, with a lot of work, but then it gets to the point where it's not, no longer suitable for, for use in food preparation. And then we can take what would have otherwise be a waste material and use it for a feedstock. So when we bring in a kilogram of that, we make a kilogram of biomass. It's a one-to-one -one conversion. Now, when we make that kilogram of biomass, about 80% of that biomass is PHA. The other 20% is about an even distribution of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and that can be used as a very high-value nutritional additive for animal feed. And so we have um, you know, pretty close to a zero-waste process, so very efficient conversion process. It's not energy-intense because the, all of the polymerization is enzymatic, and you know, we both know how efficient nature is at designing proteins that function as chemical catalysts, and we call them enzymes. And then we have um, the process that we use to separate the pHA from the other 20% of the biomass that's not pHA is all water-based, so it's an aqueous-type process. And we try to recover as much of that water as possible. You know, we lose some to evaporation, but then, of course, that just goes back into the, the water cycle. So probably 85% of the water that we bring in, we recover it, recycle it, and it goes right back into the process. And then we have another process that's at the laboratory scale now. It's probably a decade away from being viable at the industrial scale, but it's direct carbon capture. So much like plants capture CO2 directly from the atmosphere, we have a process to do the very same thing except those carbon atoms go into PHA. And we ultimately will be using that process because then that eliminates the need for us to transport you know, the waste cooking oil from one location to another. So we'll have a dual track. We'll be able to use the waste materials and we'll be able to use CO2 that's just captured directly from the atmosphere. And so we, we like that circularity. But once we have the PHAs, we combine them into what we call a resin. And from that point, the film conversion is exactly like is done with plastics. So the same equipment, the same processes. We even make the PHA resin into little pellets that are identical to the type of plastic pellets that the converter would make. Because it's very important if you want to do something at large scale to make the material work with the existing installed base of capital equipment. You know, converters can't afford to recapitalize their entire operation. Do you have something to add to the conversation? Use hashtag goodgarbage to add your own insights, ideas, and opinions on regenerative packaging and zero waste solutions. Now, let's get back to the conversation. This really takes me towards the usages. And I know you mentioned in passing some of the usages. And of course, once it's a pellet, it can be used in multiple ways. And what do you think are the best usages for the material? And I, of course, see on your website numerous different usages. What are you most excited about? Yeah, so in the near term, we see food service, food packaging, apparel, so different textiles and then non-wovens for personal care items. Uh, so things like uh, you know, baby wipes, uh, feminine care products, baby diapers, uh, non-wovens that are used in uh, you know, the medical field. And then, of course, you know, food service items uh, like uh, cups and lids and straws and cutlery, you know, food packaging films, takeout containers, and uh, we have some really exciting uh, fabrics that 
over the next few years will be coming to the market from some exciting brand owners who are, are really working hard to get away from the, the microplastic generating materials that are currently used in, in clothing. So some, some really exciting things going on there. So clothing and food, you know, those are two of the biggest necessities that a human has regardless of where you live. And so we want to focus on that first. You know, personal care uh, comes really close uh, behind that as well. So food and food packaging, food distribution, clothing, and then personal care items. So those are the big three areas where we're focused. And that's extremely versatile because so it's a wide variety of usages and that's really exciting. One of the things you referred to earlier and I'm really excited to learn about is that you mentioned flexible films and that I feel is such a huge challenge and we don't talk about it enough. And it was really nice to hear you talk about the possibility of using PHAs for a shelf life application or an application where there is barriers. How do you see that and how would you ideally engineer that application? Yeah, so for those very high barrier applications, PHA can be an important component, but PHA by itself does not have the physical and mechanical property performance envelope that would enable a really long shelf life, high barrier material. PHA is actually pretty good as, as an oxygen barrier. Uh, it's among the best, but it's average in terms of a water vapor barrier. Now, for liquid water, it's an outstandingly good barrier, but for water vapor, it's about the same level as PET. So PET is used as um, you know a beverage packaging material, and it's it's okay. It's not good enough to use for long shelf life. Like you know, when you open your bag of chips, you want them to be crunchy. And if you made a bag with just PET or just PHA. After about three months, it wouldn't be crunchy anymore. So what we have developed are some really exciting other biopolymers. They happen to be carbohydrate polymers that work incredibly synergistically with PHA to replace the type of petroleum-derived barriers that we have now, along with aluminum. You know, most of our high barrier packaging today is vapor-deposited aluminum, and it's deposited on a substrate that's usually a petroleum-derived material. So we have an exciting new class of polymers that function as good as or better than aluminum for the vapor barrier. And when you deposit aluminum on a film, it's a very expensive process. The good thing about aluminum is that it's infinitely recyclable, But the bad thing about it is once it's put into a multi-layer structure in a chip bag, it's not economical to recycle it anymore. And so what we want to do is replace aluminum as a barrier material in these multi-layer packaging uh, applications. You cannot do it just with PHA alone. But to make a multi-layer structure of a biodegradable PHA with a biodegradable carbohydrate-based polymer. Both are natural materials. We find them in nature. They don't cause any harm to humans or other any other type of life form. They biodegrade naturally and go right back into the carbon cycle. So, you know, we have a number of things in our pipeline. PHA is the one that gets the most attention uh, because it's so exciting and versatile. But we also have to have other materials that can work with PHA. There's no one single material that's the magic solution for everything. You have to have a lot of different materials that can work synergistically with each other. And, you know, that's the same whether it's a synthetic material or a natural material. What we try to do is when our customers have a problem they want us to work on, we have a a big portfolio of these natural materials that, that we can work with to create a solution and in the case of vapor barrier, moisture vapor barrier, and, and long shelf life high barrier packaging, it takes PHA plus some of these other materials to, to get the solution. But they can still be natural materials that don't harm people or the environment. And uh, you seem to have mastered the art of being able to raise money. 
how does one go about it? Because I know that a lot of listeners here are people who are startups trying to build businesses around bio products. What would your advice be? How should one approach that? And, and maybe the kind of investors that we should look for. Yeah, I, I wish I could say I had mastered the art of raising money. <laughs> it uh, We have very, very thankfully, and I'm really grateful to our investors that have uh, have provided the, the dollars that we've needed to do this. You know, since we started the company, we've raised about $200 million that we've put to work in terms of, of getting to the point we are now. We still have more, runny, more money that we need to raise, uh, but we're nearing the end of our journey for where we need to raise equity and uh, moving closer to the point where you know we can expand with debt capital and with cash that we generate in the business. But but we're we're actually in the process of another capital raise now that will probably be our last or our next to last. What we've found to create interest with investors is of course there needs to be a compelling benefit to humans in in some way. What we have found is that our focus on making people's lives better having an offering that improves people's health and the health of the environment is a a very compelling uh, narrative. What we've chosen to do is focus on large global brand owners because that's where we feel like we can make rapid impact. It's probably much more difficult to focus on individual consumers in the early stages. So my advice would be to position your product in a way that you can interest these large global brand owners. You know, let's use a company like uh, Kimberly Clark or or PepsiCo, for example. They are going to understand more about individual consumer behavior and individual consumer needs than I will ever understand because that's their business. You know, and they've been in business for over a hundred years serving the needs of individual consumers. And they are really, really good at that. You know, they've really invested tremendous resources and time understanding how to interact with individual consumers. And so as a startup, as a very young company, you know, RWDC is about five years old now. You know, the, the kind of effort that it would take to be able to be effective with individual consumers, you know, that's decades and decades of investment. And so what we've chosen to do is partner with these large global brand owners and make sure that we, we really thoroughly understand their needs. We understand the directions they want to go in we understand the problems they're trying to solve, and then we build a solution for them that makes their life easy. We, we want our brand owner customers to be heroes to the individual consumers that they're serving. And so, you know, if I can make you the hero to your customers and create all that value for your brand and for your customers, then you're naturally going to think of me as a provider that can, can help you with what you need. There's a there's a saying that I borrowed from, his name is Zig Ziglar. You know, you can have anything in life you want if you'll help enough other people get what they want. So I think that the, the really important things in when you're raising money, and you're trying to think about how to deliver a message to an investor or a customer is figure out what it is they need. What is it that they want? And then create an offering that meets that need or that want, and then you'll capture their attention. And then your responsibility is to deliver on the things that you've said you will provide to them. And we have found that to be something that's enabled us, you know, to be able to get the capital that we've needed. You are a very wise man, Daniel Caraway. (laughs) But, uh, uh, and two things actually in your business model that really are apparent for me uh, one is uh, work on base products and then, then distribute them. And the second is look for scale. So where does that fire in the belly come from? And what is it that you are seeking in this stage of your life and what you want to leave behind? You know, really my um, my desire is just to see people's lives improved. I, I love people. 
you know, when you look around your surroundings, really the only thing that is long-term and lasts forever is people and, and your relationships. And so I, I guess just being a, a little nerd that grew up out in agricultural, something about being in an environment that there weren't as many people around and you know you needed to help your neighbors, maybe that was part of the genesis of it. But just just wanting to see people have pleasant and productive lives and then propagate that as broadly as possible. You know, all of us at an individual level, we operate in our own self-interest. That's just part of who we are as humans. But I think we have to be careful to make sure that we don't let our self-interest encroach on others' self-interest. So, you know, the things that I enjoy and the things that I want are important to me, and they may be different than the things that you want and the things that are important to you, but that doesn't mean they have to be exclusive. I can help you achieve the things that you want and have fun together doing it, and then, you know, I can get the things I want to. So really, for me, I don't really care about a legacy for Daniel Carraway. What I care about is a legacy for your children and your grandchildren and a society that can have peace and harmony and pleasant existence. And, you know, If there's some little part we can do by providing materials that can bring people together for a broader good for everyone, but that's just exciting to me to use science and nature, uh, you know, to see that happen. And that is absolutely beautiful to hear. So what does the idea of good garbage mean to you? Oh, I, I think that's a very, and we could probably talk another couple of hours on that. But I think, you know, to me, good garbage is... When we have materials that have provided a lot of value in their initial application, that we have ways we can take those materials and use them for another application. And and to me, it's the circularity. Sure, maybe we call it garbage, but it's good garbage if then we can put it in some kind of circular process where those materials don't become harmful where they don't interfere with you know, the function of our environmental systems and they don't cause harm to human health. So I think the circularity conversation is a good one to have and, and if we can think about that when we're designing materials and articles, then we would have all good garbage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel, for sparing your time and thank you for serving humanity and such a wonderful way and thank you for sharing all your wisdom with us thank you for being on the show well it's my pleasure and thank you for having us i look forward to to hopefully being able to talk more thank you for listening to the good garbage podcast follow us on social media to never miss an episode links are in the description below i'm your host Vedh krishna see you next time